Welcome everyone to our fourth series seminar hosted by Plants Village. My name is Winnie Onyango and I will be moderating sessions today. So today we have Dr. Bipina Timilsena, an entomologist from Pennsylvania State University. Her research work focuses on chemical ecology of plant insect interactions and has been graciously contributing her knowledge to work with Plant Village on fall animal surveillance and modeling. And we also have Dr. David Hughes, who is the Dorothy Hark and Jay Lydon Hark Chair in Global Food Security at Penn State and founder of Plant Village along with Dr. Chilal, who is head of his department in plant pathology at Moy University, the co-director for Plant Village and founder of Dream Dream Agro Consultancy Limited. Lastly, we have Annalise Cash, Plant Village Executive Director on FOC for technical queries, if you have any issue with Zoom throughout the webinar, you can message her directly also. Then at this point, I want to begin the presentation section of the seminar and I will pass the mic to Dr. Bipana to start her presentation. Remember to put all your questions in the chat or Q&A and uh, then I will call one on each person to ask their questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you everyone and welcome Dr. Bipana. Um, thank you, thank you Winnie for a nice introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the uh, fall armyworm distribution in Africa under the current and projected future climates and also talk a little bit about chemical ecology of plant, insect and parasitic interaction. So this, this presentation is a part of my dissertation uh, in, um, which I completed in Penn State. So before I start, just a little bit background on the fall armyworm. So the fall armyworm is an insect pest native to North and South America. This pest uh, was first reported in Nigeria in 2016, and by the end of 2017, this pest was reported in many countries in this continent. This pest did not stop there. It spread to Yemen and India in 2018 and other South Asian countries, including China in 2019. And last year, it was also reported in Australia. Since its introduction, fall armyworm has emerged as a serious threat to the productivity of cereal crops, such as maize and sorghum, and these are the two major staple food crops of smallholder farmers in Africa. Therefore, this pest is affecting food security of millions of African farmers with high impact in Eastern, Central, and Western African countries. Um, to control fall armyworm, many African countries have distributed and spread tons of synthetic pesticide. For example, government of Zimbabwe alone distributed 102 liters of pesticide that valued, one, that valued about 2 million US dollar. So in this picture, we can see an extension worker demonstrating pesticide application in the field without wearing safety gears, such as masks or gloves. So this is very risky. Although this pesticide application is um, subsidized, was initially subsidized by government, it is um, not sustainable. And there is a need to develop more sustainable approaches to the fall armyworm management. So um, alternative control measures to control fall armyworm uh, includes the use of biopesticide, biological control agent, and agroecological practices such as intercropping with legume, diversifying farm environment, and push-pull technology. This push-pull technology was initially developed to control maize, maize steam borer, 
and it is also effective to control fall armyworm. And several studies in Africa confirm that there are several natural uh, enemies of fall armyworm, um, and ECP is now uh, ECP and plant release in collaboration with ECP uh, is rearing and releasing parasitoid in several parts of Kenya to control fall armyworm. Although these alternative control measures are effective to control fall armyworm um, in a field trials to make long and short term strategies to implement these approaches in a larger area, we need to identify the area where fall army worm can persist year round um, and, um, where, and the areas where it become active only during favorable season. So to identify the habitat of suitability for a seasonal and per permanent fall army worm population under climate change scenarios, I used the climax model. So this model actually matches the temperature and moisture requirements for the fall armyworm growth and development with the climate at the particular particular location. So uh, these, um, these, these are the model outputs. And in these figures, white areas, these white areas suggest the um, areas unsuitable for fall armyworm year round persistence. And green color suggests marginal areas. Yellow suggests suitable areas. And red suggests the uh, optimal area for year round fall armyworm establishment. So, uh, according to this model result, um, these models suggest that the fall army worm can establish itself in almost all countries in Eastern, Central, and Western Africa, and last part of Western Africa under the current climate condition. And under the future climate condition, uh, so I have models for 2030, 2050, and 2080 under two different climate change models. And both of these models suggest that um, the fall armyworm uh, establishment range will decrease over time, time under the future climate condition, but it's still, but it's still last part of, uh, of the central um, of, Eastern and some part of Western African countries can support fall army worm um, until by the end of um, 2080. So the major, uh, when we look for a major factor limiting the fall army worm distribution in North African countries and South African countries, um, we found that heat and dry stress are the major factor limiting fall army worm distribution in uh, Northern and um, Southern African countries. Meaning if uh, these dry areas uh, receive more rainfall than the climate model predicted, then the fall army worm could also infect into these areas and cause economic loss there. Um, so we know that the fall army maize maize host of fall army worm is maize, and then uh, the, we also map the um, suitable areas for maize cultivation, and then we took the intersection areas between the suitable areas for fall army worm and its maize host maize to better understand the risk of fall army worm in Africa. So uh, currently, large part of Eastern and Eastern Western and Central Africa is suitable for both fall armyworm and is major, ho major host maize. But the area is projected to decrease over time. And by the end of 2080, only these red, um, red areas will have suitable area for fall armyworm and maize. This means these red areas have potential to serve as a breeding ground for fall armyworm, like um, here in Florida and Texas in the US. And from these breeding region or hotspot of fall armyworm, fall armyworm could seasonally migrate to the north and to the south and pose economic loss. So um, we have already know that uh, we already know that the fall army worm has already established in Africa, and this continent has optimal climate 
for year-round follow me worm persistence. And the follow me worm eradication is not possible and pesticide as a sole control measure is not sustainable. So there are many other alternative methods to control fall armyworm and the biological control is one of them. So I'm not going to talk about the biological control of fall armyworm because it was already covered by our last seminar speaker, Dr. Ivan Cruz. So here I'm going to provide some basic information on how parasitoids find their host. So if you uh, couldn't attend the last week presentation, it is available in Plant Village YouTube channel. So the um, plant, plants are actually smarter, very smart than we think. They can distinguish between mechanical damage and real herbivore damage by recognizing herbivore is speed they deposit while feeding on the um, leaf, leaf wounding side. And the vibration uh, during herbivore feeding. So this uh, herbivore is speed actually contain uh, contains uh, several small and large molecules that acts as an elicitor to induce um, anti herbivore defense in plant. So once this, this plant recognizes the herbivore damage, it produces several volatile organic compound con that consists of like green leaf volatile, monoterpene, sesquiterpene, aromatic compound, and aldoxine. So the major idea of this slide is that when these um, herbivore feed and plant, they emit, they produce some kind of smell and that smell has, that smell contains many, many um, chemical compounds. And these, all these volatile, um, actually, they, they function multiple ecological role in the plant, uh, plant insect uh, system. So these herbivore actually deter, um, this volatile deter herbivore and egg laying moth of herbivore and also reduce the feeding preference of herbivore as a direct plant defense. It also provides the herbivore specific information to the predator and parasitoid of the herbivore and recruit them as an indirect defense. So besides these direct and indirect defense, these plant volatile also um, primes the nearby neighboring plant to respond faster and more strongly uh, to the subsequent herbivore damage. So uh, although these, uh, these graphs is not related to the fall army worm, I, uh, I would like to show some example. So uh, these graphs uh, represents the volatile produced by these two different insect damaged tobacco plant. So in this graph, each peak represents the individual compound and the height of these peak, peaks represent the amount of that compound. So if you, if you uh, pay close attention to these graphs, you can see that some, uh, some, um, some peaks are higher than, the, than these graphs. That means these hard before induce uh, more volatile than these hard before feeding damage. So here is a, um, so in this graph, we can see the emission pattern and amount, emission pattern amount and ratio of volatile produced by these two herbivore. Um, and this pattern is totally different. For example, this, helio, this is heliotis fluorescence, um, tobacco, bodworm, and this induced large amount of G3 hexanol. This is one of the volatile that um, tobacco plant produced when fed by this herbivore, and it's very small amount of E2 hexanol. But when the same plant is damaged by this Manduca sexta, then the plant emits a small amount of G3 hexanol and larger amount of E2 hexanol. And this ratio of uh, G3 to E2 hexanol provides the herbivore specific information to the egg predator of um, Manduca sexta. So similar to this system, when the fall armyworm feeds on maize plant or when the fall armyworm moth lays eggs on maize plant, this maize plant releases 
for armyworm specific volatile in the surround uh, volatile and this volatile actually attract the natural enemy of fall armyworm like parasitoid and this parasitoid could control the fall armyworm population in the field in addition to this volatile um, this plant also produce some um, other non-volatile chemical compound that actually affects the um, growth and development of herbivore feeding on the plant. So um, as a summary, um, under the current climate, um, we have the, our model suggests that Falarmi worm can establish itself in almost all the countries in Eastern and, of, and Central Africa and last part of Western Africa. And under the future predicted climate, the pest establishment range will um, decrease gradually over time. However, the large area in Eastern and Central Africa could serve as hotspot or breeding spot from where fall army worm can migrate to the unsuitable areas um, to the um, north and south and pose economic threat during the favorable season. And uh, when the fall army worm appears on maize plant, it releases the volatile organic compound that attract, that provide the uh, fall army worm specific information to the natural enemies and attract them from the distance and control the fall army worm population in the field. So I, um, so that's all about um, today's presentation. And if you have any question about like fall army worm distribution modeling part, or if you have any information, if you have any question about um, chemical ecology part, I'm happy to take any question. And you can also reach me uh, via um, email, um, which is... And uh, also contact me for the um, gym team member. Also contact me in um, base camp. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bipana, for a very nice session talk uh, about. Uh, uh, the interaction of polami worm with the maize and uh, just to give a quick uh, background on interaction like dream team members directly to farmers and also the fails this is also a challenge that we have experienced especially in kenya because most of the parts in kenya uh, we deeply depend on maize and also i think the second host like you said is a uh, sorghum we have also seen some little damage on sorghum with the polami worm, but the great damage is uh, mostly on maize. So when we started uh, working as a team here in Kenya, uh, that is Dream Team, we did started by doing the uh, mapping of the fields to identify where the maize are grown, especially in Busia region, uh, where maize are greatly grown and also to uh, understand the pattern on how uh, that full armyworm destroys the crop maize. And we came to realize that at some point they have a distinctive pattern. I don't know if you have anything that is just a physical method on how sometimes it's easy to identify if destruction is from full armyworm or any other pest because you know we have other pests like stroke borers. Yeah, so we realized that it's having a, a distinctive pattern on the leaves, especially when the leaves are young. And uh, also looking at the refuses, you can find easily, that is another way that we use to identify if the pest is still alive on the crop or not. So we look at the refuse. Um, and another thing, we came to come in contact with farmers having some mythical uh, understanding about the pest, that there is a possibility that the, when the pest destroys the crop, it increases the production, which uh, scientifically, I don't think there is any reality on that. But that one was another mythical thing that we have to understand. And as time passes by, as we did extension services, we 
we now came to explain to farmers the meaning of destruction or damage level and the uh, the cost that the thing that it may be uh, the side effect of the pest itself and if at all the damage is too high what are the side effects then also um uh, we also tried applying the biopesticides and also encouraging farmers to do so, like the use of neem extract. Uh, we have the ash. I don't know if you can concur with that. The use of neem extract, we have ash, we have uh, pepper and uh, others. So um, I don't know if there is anyone who is having a question, but that was just a quick uh, background on what we have been doing. And again, you are talking about parasitoids as a form of um, controlling or managing a uh, fall armyworm. And this is a nice idea that uh, right now Plant Village is working on. And we have did some trials in different parts of Kenya, and we saw a great difference on how the parasitoids are helping in controlling uh, for lamiwam as compared to fifth that uh, parasitoids were not applied. So thank you so much for that. And maybe we can go through uh, Q&A. And the first person is Melodin. I think if uh, our uh, analyst can help and unmute Melodin to ask her question directly, it will be so much great. Thank you. Um, so uh, I would like to um, just talk about the yield thing, like when you you told you you were saying like uh, whether it's a meat or not, when fall armyworm damage the plant, sometimes farmers see increase in yield. So if the fire, so actually there is a chemical, there is also a chemical chemical thing. Um, there so when fall armyworm damage on one plant it produced the chemical and that came the and, and the nearby plant actually that plant perceived that kept that volatile signal and then it can prepare for the for the faster and stronger response to the subsequent attack and at the same time the plant when it has like um just a just a least a moderate amount of damage it also uh, prepares itself for um, faster, like um, earlier flowering and also increase the yield. Um, so in a, in a small amount of damage, it could be possible um, that, um, that the plant that, that is experienced moderate amount of damage or that plant that is near to the severely damaged plant, um, it could um, increase a little bit amount, little bit yield but when the plant uh, experienced like uh, more damage, uh, I think um, yield it yield will like definitely gonna um, get lower. Like we farmers will get lower yield. Um, and the question here is about the um, optimal temperature and maximum moisture needed in order to get to know and predict the distribution of all anywhere. Okay, I would like. I would like to share. So the fall armyworm actually it cannot tolerate uh, temperature. So according to the various uh, several literature, the fall armyworm cannot tolerate temperature above thirty six degrees Celsius, and the temperature. Uh, less than 12 degrees Celsius is also not uh, suitable for anywhere. So when the temperature goes below 12 degrees Celsius, it, the, um, the development rate will drop down, drastically drop down. And the pupa, if the, if the fall armyworm enters into the pupal stage, the, the fall armyworm cannot emerge as a healthy adult. So the fall armyworm, might like um, might have deformed wing uh, if the temperature goes above 36 degree or below 12 degrees Celsius. And about the soil moisture, so um, as long as the uh, soil has the optimal moisture for plant growth and development, fall armyworm can survive on those plants. 
and uh, when the plant dry, dries, polarmiwara also do not get food and then it will die. So um, that about the soil moisture, it, it depends on how well the plant can perform on that soil, soil moisture. So. Okay, thank you Anna, for that. Um, I think uh, Annalise, if you can load in to ask the question there, please. Melody, please you may go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, so uh, my question was, uh, I wanted to know maybe the temperature ranges in the pest free uh, regions. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, Northern and Southern Africa, because I believe you said that those areas are very hot. So I believe that uh, in Eastern uh, in Eastern Africa we have some hot areas, mm -hmm. and I would like to know the temperature uh, ranges so that we can uh, maybe compare with this region and see the pest damage, the level of pest damage in this region that has maybe almost the same temperature ranges uh, with uh, Southern and Northern Africa. So, um, so when I modeled um, this polarium distribution, it was, um, so uh, I used the 30 year temperature data, the average of 30 year temperature data, but um, there are several other factors that affect the polarium distribution. Like you said, like um, there are some uh, hot regions in Eastern Africa, but if you provide, so, and there are also some hot, very hot regions in, um, in Northern Africa, but um, but there are like several polarming worm presence records, for example, in Egypt. So that's a pretty hot area, but um, we are receiving polarium records from that reason. Because most of the area, most of the maize growing areas in those hot regions are irrigated areas. And when we apply irrigation and where are there, when there are plants there, it creates the microenvironment. And in that like micro drone, in, the, in that micro drone, the temperature might be different than we measured, than we used for modeling. And uh, that micro, micro environment, that, that micro environment that creates the, like, um, that is created by the applying, so um, applying irrigation and um, having different plants at different stages, that affects the fall arming worm or any other phase growth and development and their activity. So in most of the time, if the temperature is around like um, 25 to 30 degrees Celsius in that microclimate region, then that is the perfect temperature for fall annual growth and development. That means like if you provide the 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, then the fall annual can complete its, its life cycle like in um, 25, 27 or 30 days. So that is too fast. So um, yes, temperature, temperature definitely like um, affects the fall army worm um, generally, like um, the fall army worm performance and um, damage. And uh, when we talk about the temperature, we also need to consider the microclimate that is generated by different, um, different things um, like irrigation or crop canopy or different crop varieties. So, in, yeah, I don't know what I answered your question, but yeah, there are several different factors uh, we need to take consider when we yes. talk about it. Yes, thank you. Uh, so can we rate the host factors as the most, uh, maybe the full amount needs more than the environmental factor, that is temperature mm -hmm. and other microclimate factors? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Melodian, for that wonderful question. So we are moving to this next question that has been asked by Matthias. Please, uh, you can ask your question up to Annalisa, I've unmuted you. Hello, my question was, what is the appropriate time to put, to put in the fully amyone measures? Since you'll find some farmers doing it at when the measures are already starting to test or some not yet, maybe at the production of vegetative stage. Vegetative stage, what is the appropriate time? So, 
Okay, so the following were mock. Um, so depending on several um, research studies that I recently read, the full army were not actually likes to lay egg on younger plants. So if you plant um, plant uh, maize, for example, one one month uh, in one like um, so if you if you plant uh, maize now and if the if the field has the maize plant that was planted one month earlier, then the full army were moth will choose the earlier planted um, maize to lay eggs. So and um, and if you um, can uh, so it is always better to find more uh, fall armyworm moth at earlier stage because the fall armyworm larva uh, first, second, and third in third instar larva they, they cause just a little bit damage, but the fourth, fifth, and sixth instar larva they are very voracious and they can remove large larger areas of uh, from the leaf and cause major severe damage. And if they successfully like um, go into the pupal stage and uh, go immerse as a moth, then one fall armyworm moth can lay a, like hundreds of eggs. So, but if you can control, the, if you can um, go and look for your plant and uh, look for eggs or look for earlier instar lar uh, larva, and um, could uh, kill them, then that will that will really um, help to control the fall army worm. And about other control measures, when to apply, yeah, always. Um, so um, yeah, always look for earlier stages. Look for beginning of your planting season during the knee height stage, rather than looking for like silking stage or tasseling stage. Because um, those those earlier is, stays maize will also suffer a lot if if fall armyworm damage them. And during the latter stages, like tasseling stages, um, maybe the fall armyworm, if there are just a few uh, fall armyworm there, the plant can uh, survive. But um, the later, the, but the earlier stages um, plant, they cannot survive because they are just a little leaf and fall armyworm can really eat all, all the leaf material. So always look for, look during the earlier stages of plant. Okay, thank you, um, Matthias, for the question. I think you have been answered and also part of the team has also understood. Uh, we are moving to the next question, which has been answered uh, uh, asked by Liverson. So please, you can go ahead and ask your question directly. Okay. Uh, my question is there. Uh, many farmers around my area are planting maize due to low maize production, the current maize in the field. High volume attack was the key cause for the low yields. So are these farmers enhanced high level of fall armyworm in the region? Or what's the scenario of fall armyworm from the current maize to the replanted maize? What's the scenario? Yeah. So um, if I understand correctly, so you are saying like fall farmers are experiencing low yield and uh, due to fall armyworm and for what happens if they plant uh, like a new batch of mage? Is that correct? Uh, could you please repeat yeah. your question? Exactly, 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 exactly. Yeah, so if there are, if, the, if, the, if, if in that field, um, if there are existing maize crop and if the farmer wanna uh, plant the um, another batch of maize crop in the same field without removing the old field, then there is a high chance that fall armyworm will attack the newer batch of maize. Because like I told you before, fall armyworm moth really prefers to lay egg on um, earlier stage maize plant. 
because these early stage maize plant produce some kind of volatile that is very attractive to the egg laying moth of fall armyworm. And there is a very high chance that fall armyworm moth will lay egg on the earlier, newer beds of maize plant instead of like older beds of uh, maize plant. Okay, thank you on that um, clarification. And I think we have the next question from Edward Amor. Please Edward, you can go ahead and ask the question. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, um, I was hoping to ask well, what you think is the, the yield reduction percentage, a potential yield reduction percentage um, by far. Like if fall and worm infest um, a farm and it's not controlled, what is the expected yield reduction um, that we can expect? Um, and also how does the climate or other environmental factors influence this yield reduction. Because I've read a couple of papers from Ghana and from Kenya, and the yield reduction seems to be a range from 22 to about um, 60, uh, 67 or something, 60 something. And from, uh, I think it's studies from Zambia or Zimbabwe, um, the yield reduction was about 11%. So I'm, I'm wondering how on the yield reduction from fall and one is such a wide range and, and sort of different from different places. What, what, what do you think is the influence in this? Um, I think that depends on like which kind of maize variety you are using and also like uh, the climate, of course. So for example, some some maize variety, I, I don't know uh, more about the maize variety that uh, African farmers um, used to plant in their farm, but um, different maize varieties have um, different capacity to defend against the um, herbivore. Some are some can uh, defend like um, some are more um, resistant or tolerant, and some are less resistant. And um, and every plant, every plant when when herbivore feeds on plant, every plant produces some level of. Um, level of uh, defensive compound. I told I talked a lot about the um, plant produce volatile, which is also defensive. And uh, they also produce some kind of hormone like jasmonic acid or other um, other secondary metabolites. And that really affects the um, feeding preference of herbivore. And they also that that also really affect like um, how attractive are those plant um, for hard rivers uh, and the egg laying moth of all river. So I do not have like exact percentage or exact number like um like of what in like how much this fall are neuron could cause the yield loss. So it could like it could it could really vary from um, maybe five percent to maybe hundred percent that totally depends on several different several factors like presence of natural living enemies in the in that location and if you do not apply any control measures in your farm um, but your neighboring farm is applying some some level of control measures that also affects the uh, fall army when population in your farm so there is no exact number of um, like how how much it loss can we expect? But yes, they it is like it is affected by different different factors in the environment, whether you use the control measure or not. It is really affected by your neighboring farm or like your your um, other 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 aspects. Yeah. So yeah, it 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 vary it vary really, and you and you when you read the literature, you can see like from 5% to like you said, it's about 70% or even you can see even 100%. And that also, that also depends on at what stage the fall army worm is causing the damage. If it is, if the, if the fall army worm, if the last number of fall army worm population um, is percent during the earlier stage, like I told, uh, um, then the damage could be more. But if the fall army worm, um, if there are fall army worm at the later stage, of the crop, then the damage could be less. Um, yeah, that that totally like depends on lots of factors. 
Thank you. Thank you, Edward, for that question. Uh, we are moving on. I think you are referring out quite well because some questions are still coming in. And the next question is from Brian Wachie. Please, you may go ahead and ask your question. So uh, my question is, why is the control plot seem to be doing better than the push pull? Yeah. Why the control plot is doing better than push pull? Uh -huh. So I can interrupt quickly. Um, Melodine had asked a similar question and she can provide some more background information from her question. I think they align very uh, similarly. So please, Melodine, you can provide more. Yeah, so uh, the question was, uh, sometimes you find that the, the push-pull plot is not doing well, but when you see the control plot, it works well. So we were asking if uh, maybe uh, by any chance there is a competition between uh, maize and uh, desmodium, that's apart from the nitrogen, nitrogen fixing factor, or uh, the problem is on the management, or maybe the full armyworm uh, prefers some other hosts compared to another. So in this case, we have the maize as the host and we have the bracaria in the edge of the field. So maybe at some point it will prefer maize more than uh, bracaria and it will want to go for bracaria and uh, prefers to, to stay in the maize plant. I don't know if you get the question. Um, I got the question, but I really don't know why, um, why would uh, pull school plot um, perform like poorer than the um, control plot. I would expect like um, like if, if there is a monocrop mono in a control plot that that would um, perform like maybe if in the presence of a army worm that would prefer that would perform poorer than the um, push pool. So one one reason could be like you said um, maybe the poor management and uh, the competition between the plant. So do, I think, um, I don't know about the uh, desmodium, um, but um, in case of like leguminous plant, so at the earlier stage, um, the leguminous plant actually gets some, gets some nutrient from the soil. And um, if you, uh, that's my experience when I worked in Nepal. So when, when you plant, um, plant the intercrop earlier than the main crop um, then then there might be some kind of competition like competition for space competition for light because the the time you plant the main crop maybe the intercrop is already kind of like um they, they already covered some part of the ground and uh, also had a shading effect for the main crop. And sometimes if the, if the intercrop is faster growing crop and if you plant the main crop and intercrop at the same time, but the intercrop is faster growing and that is providing, that is causing the shading effect in the main crop, then that could be a reason of like, um, poor performance in the, this um, intercrop system. So I, I really don't know about the desmodium, how fast it grows and um, whether there is any competition if you plant both of the crop at the same time or if you plant at a different time. I don't know, maybe that's due to the, maybe the um, management thing or maybe the spacing thing. If you have really like, um, if you plant, uh, if you do not follow their spacing guideline, and if there is very limited space to expand for both of these crops, and that might create the competition. Um, yeah, and maybe the nutrition thing, like uh, this no DM is like nitrogen fixing um, crop, but. Um, but the maize crop also need other nutrients than nitrogen such as phosphorus and potassium and other micronutrients. Uh, so it could be like nutrient thing. Um, yeah, um, I don't, I really don't, I really don't know. I couldn't answer the question, but I, I don't know. Well, that's, um... 
I think that is food for thought and also for the scientists in the house. Um, maybe some, anything from John Chalal or David Hugg. Any of you can say something about it as professors. It, it, maybe we don't have sufficient power to determine it. Maybe we don't have a, a sufficiently large experiment. This was one of my thoughts. And so oftentimes when we see things, um, sure, uh, on both the control or the treatment side, some, some plots might stand out as doing particularly well. But if we only have three controls and three experimental plots, it, it would not be sufficient in order to... Uh, assess it. So we want a larger sample size. So in statistics, we often talk about uh, the the ability to have power to be able to discriminate between a control and a treatment. In addition, we would also like to have replication. So we would like to repeat it in different locations and at different times to show that the effect is actually real and important. Um, oftentimes, though, when you do observe things, it, it has an importance. Um, but I think my answer would be we would need more statistical power before we can say something concretely. John? Um, just to add, um, I think one of the things that we didn't do, because this was just a small plot, um, one of the things we will be looking at is to do a soil test. So we really haven't done any test on the soil. So we we don't know yet. We are expecting, you know, the, leg, the desmodium to give some nitrogen, but maybe we have some more problems with pH, for example, so that we don't have uptake of these phosphorus and the rest. So I think more um, going forward, we look, as David put it, we probably want to do bigger scale and also different locations, but also look at other factors like the soil, um, pH, the you know, EC, and number of other factors that may have actually contributed to the non-performance of the Thank you. Thank you. And maybe from perspective of uh, as farmers are concerned uh, for the plots that we did establishment of push pull, I think uh, we have a lot of uh, similarity with the farmer because we didn't do as John Chalala said that we didn't do any soil test. And um, we are trying to view it as a, as a uh, farmer's perspective view. Uh, from my own understanding, from what we did, I think uh, um, push pull was very good in controlling striga. I can attest to it 100%, and Dream Team members can also attest to that. The first uh, se season of planting, there was up, nearly up to 50% control of striga and fall annual. Then when time progresses by and there's good establishment of striga and bracaria, uh, I think most of our demo plots was able to achieve up to 80% control of striga and uh, also for amiwam, just a few uh, destruction. But now the main challenge was posing on the side of production level as time progresses by from the first season to the second, we find that instead of um, um, the yield accelerating, it was just deteriorating. And also if you look at the health of maize, which was our main crop, instead of maybe flourishing well in the second season, things were deteriorating. And that's why you find uh, Dream Team members are, are actually questioning if uh, push pull was a good technology, for controlling uh, striga and uh, and full amiwam and not not to increase yield or the vice versa or all of them uh, combined. So maybe this one is a challenge we can pose to our scientists to find out when they do a such kind of research to clearly come up with the objective of the technology in advance so that when a farmer is going to apply this technology in their mind, back at their mind, they will know that if I do push pull, I'm just going to provide for feeds for my animals and to control striker and also to manage whole animal, but not to increase productivity of my maize. So that one maybe is still food for thought. And yeah, so I really appreciate for your thoughts concerning that uh, from David and also from John Chalal. I think we are moving to the next question that has been asked by Matthew. Uh, please, Matthew, you may go ahead and ask the question. Uh, 
Matthew, I think Matthew had said he, he said he's in a noisy place. I don't know whether he's back. Okay. Uh, so maybe what I can do, I can read through his question. Is there a possibility that one day we modify the pH or chemical properties of soil that it will not favor population, but will not hinder crop growth and soil health in general, as we know that population occurs mainly in soil? Can you repeat that? Okay. So, um... We can, okay, can you repeat, please? Okay, thank you. Martin is asking, is there a possibility that one day we modify the pH of the soil or chemical property of the soil so that it will not favor population but will not hinder crop growth at the same time? And this soil health in general. So is there pop any chance of doing that at all? Pupation of the fall army worm, uh, Bapana, pupation. So if we um, change the chemical property of soil that is favorable, that is good for plant, but not for um, insect, is that correct? Yes. Correct. Um, so I, I'm just trying to think about like, um, I, I don't know, I, I really do not have the answer to that question. Um, as long as the plant is doing Better and if we do not apply any control measure and the insect is present, then there is a food and if there is an insect, then it will it will cause damage on plants, right? So um, in addition to uh, improving the um, chemical property of the soil, we also think about like waste. I think yeah. How to... um, so I think the question also relates to will the um, caterpillar be able to successfully transition to an adult when it goes in the soil? Could we do something? And I think the answer there might be that it doesn't require any nutrients uh, during this important stage. It requires a lot of, it has a lot of body changes. It requires oxygen, uh, but it's, it's unlikely that the pH uh, can be affected to, to change that because it, it's not relying upon the pH. Uh, desiccation is really important, as Papana already said, um, but if it's going to be too dry for the pupa, it, it's too dry for the plant. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah and now I see the question. Um, yeah, so the, well, uh, the only thing I can think about, like, um, what can we do to um, prevent the emergence of pupil stills to the adult stills? So one of the um, so we could we could increase the soil moisture amount because the pupil pupil stills do not really do well on very high soil moisture. Uh, and very low soil moisture, but um, if the plant is already in uh, reproductive stage, then the high soil moisture is not really good for um, for plant. So as long as the plant is surviving there, pupa will will do like okay and um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I also have some quick questions to you, Dr. Bibana. Uh, as much as we are talking about uh, technologies that we um, uh, 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 innovate and also invent in our fields like push pole, what are your thoughts of agroforestry as in relationship to controlling fall armyworm? What could you say about that? Um, I really don't know about the agroforestry agro and how, how it helped to control the pest in the field. Uh, but like based on the previous uh, speaker and some literature that I just um, read, I think it will um, it will help to decrease to some level. Uh, but um, maybe David would answer better to that question. I I'm I'm I really have limited knowledge on that. Field. So um, we heard very well from Red Harrison. Um, uh, in a previous seminar, as well as his presentation to FAO, that it increases the number of natural enemies, both bats and birds, but also 
wasp nests and, and ants. And all of these are really important in killing the larvae while they're on the plant. So in general, it, it's a very good thing um, in order to promote in nature-based solutions because it increases natural enemies, was what Red was saying. Oh, thank you. Uh, then maybe the final question to you. Uh, as you have said that uh, there are some damages that are also done not only on maize by folamiwam, but also sorghum. So why is it that uh, damage on sorghum is a bit low as compared to maize? From your so that comes to like um, the preference of uh, egg laying mud. So I told uh, uh, I told you before these means they produce a certain chemical compounds that are very attractive to fall armyworm mud and the sorghum which is also a host crop to fall armyworm but these crops are less preferred by the fall armyworm and that's why we are seeing more um, damage on maize than than sorghum. So that's that's all about the post-plant okay, difference by Hardware. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are having the last question from Melodin, please. Melodin, you can go ahead and ask the question. I think that one is the only last one that has been sent right now. So the last question was, uh, why do young plants smells more attractive to fall and as compared to the mature plants so when plant grows their um the chemical profile also changes because the plant has different like um when they so the, in, during the vegetative stage they so they they produce um more green leafy volatile which are like um carbon six compound and um, other the latest is they change their chemical profile. So um, I do not have like list of chemical that is produced by um, young plant and old plant, but if you're interested, I can provide that to you. And depending on the um, on those chemicals, um, the moth actually decide like which is really good, which plant is good for their um, their offspring. So I I really do not have like volatile profile from maize. I, I worked on tobacco, so I do not have that volatile profile, but that is really different. And I can provide that to you if you're interested. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me check if there's some other questions. Uh, there's this another question that is coming in right now from Brian Wachie. And I think last time he was having some problem with the background. Maybe if we can just read through the question. So Brian is asking, at what point is fall armyworm intervention more effective than control or management? At what point fall armyworm control measure is more effective than control? Yes. So if you if you apply the uh, control measures, whenever you see, whenever you first see the fall armyworm, either that could be either like um, egg. Or if you if you could cast the moth by using the pheromone trap, and um, if you uh, if you find few um, a few folanum moth in your trap, maybe like three to four folanum moth, and if you apply the control measures at that time, uh, then it will be more effective because once the folanum moth emerges, it is start to lay egg within few days. So uh, if you if you cast that early earlier signal, then it would be more effective than applying a control measure at the later stage, like for example, when you see the 15th star larva, 16th star larva, because at that time some of the larva might have already like um, completed this larval cycle and already went to uh, swell for pupation. So, and then you will start to see the overlapping population. So it's, all, it's always better to look for the early signal and apply control measures at that time. Okay, thank you. Um, 
for that. Uh, it was also running at the back of my mind. I almost asked about pheromone, but I'm glad that Brian asked the same thing. So I think we have uh, another question coming in. And please, you can unmute John Chalal and ask your question directly. Thank you, Bipana. Um, thank you, Winnie. Um, I, I had just a quick follow-up question on uh, the relationship. So we, we, we drought stress plants. So when plants are under some form of a drought stress, they, they tend to emit some you know, volatiles. Do we know something about polami woman, these drought stress plants? Because we tend to see, like in Kilif, where we've had some really dry conditions, we tend to see some much higher um, you know, polarming moment infestation. Of course, I know this has to do with temperature, but when a plant is drought stress, are there volatiles that they may emit that could attract polarming moment? Um, Thank you. Um, that's true. Like when um, when plant go on plants go under some kind of stress, they produce um volatile. But the important thing here is that um the volatile profile changes depending on what kind of stress they are facing. So um, during the herbivore um, gametes, uh, the same plant um, emits a certain certain profile, and when the same plant at the same stage is under other other stress condition, that could be salt stress or um, drought stress or other stress condition, they they emit um, totally different profile. So the different profile uh, doesn't mean like they, they emit um, different uh, volatile compound, but the, the amount and the ratio of that volatile compound could be different. And um, yeah, I really don't know um, whether the volatile from drought stress plant, whether they attract uh, polar or or whether they change um, be any any kind of behavior in polar newer. I really do not um, have that answer now. We need to look at some of the treasure. I don't know. Yeah, but but does this stress plant produce volatile? Okay, thank you, John, for the question and also for the answer from Dr. Bipana. I think that one marks the end of our conversation for the questions. And I just want to take this chance to thank Dr. Bipana for agreeing to present today and engage in discussion with our team. And we look forward to continue working with you and learning more about your work and how we can turn into actionable information to our farmers. Thank you to our panelists for adding your knowledge and experience into the conversation. And also thank to you, our audience, for the inquisitive questions that has been asked. It was actually a great session conversing and also sharing the idea and also the experiences that we have in different places. And we look forward to seeing you to work uh, to our next webinar. I hope you will be available if we request for one. And enjoy the rest of your day and bye for now. Thanks all. Thank you.